appropriations uh, markup for 2018. Unfortunately, we meet today under somber circumstances. We offer our thoughts and prayers to all those affected, and we hope for the swift recovery of our colleague, Congressman Steve Scalise, also for Zach Barth, Matt Micah, Special Agent David Bailey, Special Agent Crystal Greiner, and those injured. We also commend the heroic acts of the U.S. Capitol Police, who put their lives on the line time and time after again to protect us, our staffs, and hundreds of thousands of people who visit the Capitol each year. Because of their bravery and quick thinking, many lives were saved yesterday. Our gratitude goes out not only to the officers injured, but to the entire Capitol Hill police force. Congressman Scalise, along with his security and many other members of Congress, and may I say a number of members of Congress in this room, members of the Appropriations Committee, were gathered yesterday to practice for the Congressional Baseball Game, an annual charity event designed to to bring Democrats and Republicans together in celebration of the spirit of bipartisanship. We can honor them today by embodying that spirit as we begin our full committee work for fiscal year 2018. I want to thank all of you for your hard work over the past several months. We've held more than 60 hearings over the past two and a half months to ensure that this committee maintains its essential oversight duties even within a compact schedule. These hearings help us draft fiscally sound bills like the one we're marking up today. After all, the power of the purse sits with Congress, and it is our job to make these important spending decisions on behalf of the people we represent. We will continue this critical work, holding several more budget hearings over the next several weeks, putting forth appropriations bills that adequately and res responsibly fund our federal government. We will move quickly through the process under an especially tight schedule. I appreciate your willingness to be flexible and your accommodation as we plow ahead. The White House has given us an initial blueprint. There are many items in the proposal that my Republican colleagues and I agree with, and these priorities and those of our caucus will be reflected in our bills this year. And of course, there are some we will not agree with. We've been given a mandate by the American people to change business as usual in Washington, to rein in waste and abuse, and invest in programs that are critically important, such as those included in this national security bill before us this afternoon. Now to the business at hand. Today we meet, meet to consider the fiscal year 2018 military construction and veteran affairs appropriations bill, as well as the interim 302B suballocation for this bill that will enable it to continue through the process. Now, I'd like to recognize the uh, full committee ranking member, uh, Ms. Lowy, uh, for any opening remarks she may have, and say what a pleasure it is to work with you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. And I do want to say it's an honor and a privilege for me to work with you as well. And before we begin, let me express my continued shock at yesterday's assault on members of Congress congressional staff and law enforcement just were heroic. My thoughts are with Congressman Scalise, Special Agents David Bailey, Crystal Greiner, current and former staffers Zach Barth and Matt Mika. As I keep the victims and their loved ones in my heart, I'm thankful for the courage of law enforcement and in particular, the U.S. Capitol Police, who protect members of Congress and visitors to the U.S. Capitol every day. The Capitol Police responded fearlessly in the face of great danger, saving many lives. Above, above all else, we are Americans. Today and every day, the things that unite us will always be far stronger than those that divide us. I look forward to working with my colleagues on a bipartisan basis to improve the lives of Americans. And thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Ms. Lowy, for your comments. So we'll now turn our attention to the fiscal year 2018 Military Construction and Veteran Affairs Appropriations Bill. Uh, it's my pleasure to recognize the chairman, uh, uh, Mr. Dent. 
Uh, thank you, Chairman Friedling-Heisen, for the opportunity to bring uh, this bill before the, the committee uh, this afternoon, uh, the first appropriations bill of the year. Uh, and before we move into consideration of this bill, I, I too, I think we should all take a, need, uh, take a moment to uh, reflect on the bigger picture of the environment that we find ourselves in as a result of the tragic events uh, that transpired yesterday morning. Well, I know that uh, Whip Scalise would like, to, would like us to keep moving forward on the important work before us. I, I would ask that we all continue to keep him and all the other victims of yesterday's uh, senseless attack in our thoughts and prayers. And we're particularly grateful today to have Chuck Fleischman uh, safe with us in full committee today. So Chuck, there you are. Uh, the Military Construction, VA, and related agencies bill uh, provides generously for our service members, our veterans, their families, and our monuments and cemeteries. Uh, Chairman Friedlingheisen and Mrs. Lowy have provided strong support for this bill in particular. Uh, both of them have focused on, been very focused on oversight of the electronic health record uh, for nearly 10 years. Uh, finally, finally, uh, VA has announced that uh, uh, there's going to be one single record uh, for active duty uh, and, and veterans. Uh, I appreciate the full committee uh, chairman and ranking member's leadership and the participation of all the members of the subcommittee, including our, our new ranking member, uh, Debbie Wasserman Schultz, uh, who brings a, a lot of uh, energy and dedication uh, to her new role. Uh, so we have uh, remained engaged in a very active and transparent process as we assembled this year's bill. And this bill incorporates the feedback of over 1,000 uh, member requests uh, from both sides of the aisle. Uh, now for the numbers. Uh, the bill contains $88.8 .8 billion in, in budget authority, an increase to $6 billion over last year's level, uh, $10.2 billion for military construction, which is about a $2.1 billion increase over uh, fiscal year 17 level, or about a 25 percent, heard that right, 25 percent increase. Uh, this funding recommendation strongly reinforces the priorities in the President's budget request. Uh, the bill includes $9.6 billion in uh, base funding and $638 million in uh, OCO funds. Um, the level is uh, $198 million uh, under uh, the President's request. Uh, $78.6 billion uh, for the Department of Veterans Affairs, uh, which is an increase of nearly $4 billion, $4 billion over, FY, uh, over the FY17 level and $384 million under the uh, President's budget request. Of the $78.6 billion provided for the VA, uh, 40, uh, for $69 billion is for uh, medical care, uh, for nearly 7 million veterans. Uh, we make important investments in many v VA programs, including uh, mental health treatment and suicide prevention research and claims processing at or above uh, the, uh, the budget request. And $252 million is for related agencies in our bill. That's $8 million, $8 million above the uh, requested level. Uh, the American Battle Monuments Commission, Arlington National Cemetery, uh, the Armed Forces Retirement Home, and the Court of Appeals for Veterans, uh, for veterans Claims. Uh, the increase of $8 million over the President's budget is to support security requirements at Arlington National Cemetery, and some of us have visited there not too long ago. Uh, the bill supports our troops uh, uh, with, the facilities and, uh, with, with the facilities and services necessary to maintain readiness uh, and morale at bases here in the States and around the globe. Uh, it is extremely important that we get our infrastructure in shape uh, to support the force we have now as well as the force we want to grow in the future. Uh, and the bill funds our, our veterans' health care systems to ensure that uh, our promise to care for those who have sacrificed in defense of this great nation continues as those men and women uh, return home. Uh, we owe this to our veterans, and we are committed to sustained oversight uh, so that programs uh, deliver what they promise and taxpayers are well served by the investments that we make. And I urge you to support this, uh, this, this legislation. So thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Thank you. My pleasure to recognize the ranking member, uh, Debbie Wasserman Schultz, for any comments. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate you yielding and really want to say what a thrill it has been after nearly 10 years as the ranking member uh, or the chair of the Legislative Branch Appropriations Subcommittee, which is still near and dear to my heart, to be able to join you as the ranking member and stand up for both people currently serving in the military as well as our uh, retired veterans is truly an honor. And before I begin my remarks, I want to also join my colleagues in recognizing not only all of our players uh, and colleagues who are participating in tonight's congressional baseball game, uh, but the importance of coming together and, of course, recognizing and sending best wishes for a very speedy recovery to our colleague and friend, Steve Scalise. 
uh, as well as the others who were inter injured yesterday as we continue to hold them in our thoughts and prayers. Mr. Chairman, since my first day as ranking member, you have really set a cooperative tone. So thank you, as always, for continuing to be inclusive as we work through this process. But despite that cooperation, I do regret to say that I'm disappointed that this collaboration has not extended to the full committee process, as we have yet to see 302B allocations for any other bills other than MILCON, and the MILCON VA 302B remains just a partial estimate. Nonetheless, Chairman Dent has worked tirelessly with an extremely limited amount of time to get to this point. With the President's budget being released on May 23rd, we are now marking up this bill 24 days later. Even within this short time period, this bill addresses many members' concerns as well as critical issues impacting our veterans and active and reserve service members. Specifically, this bill includes $186 million for suicide prevention, which is $13 million above the FY 2017 enacted level. With over 20 veterans tragically taking their own lives each day, this funding is critical. This funding will address staffing issues at the Veterans Crisis Line and require the VA to adhere to the standards of the American Association of Suicidology. The VA portion of this bill also provides almost $700 million for medical research, which will fund essential efforts like those to address TBI and PTSD, develop state-of-the-art prosthetics, care for victims of military sexual trauma, and treat veterans suffering from mental illness. The bill also continues to fund important programs to combat veterans' homelessness, provide our veterans with effective and timely health care, and improve the veterans' benefits application and appeals process, which remains a mess. I'm, always extreme, I'm also extremely grateful for the Chairman's support for in vitro fertilization and cover for coverage for assisted reproductive technologies for veterans who have sustained a service-connected injury that impacts their fertility. This issue is both very important to me and to so many service members. All veterans deserve to be able to start families. Moreover, providing access to IVF is consistent with the VA's goal to support veterans and improve their quality of life. On a personal note, this bill will address the issue of breast cancer awareness and prevention. As many of you know, during our subcommittee's recent visit to the Washington VA Medical Center, we learned that the VA was relying on the controversial USPSTF guidance for mammography in making coverage decisions. Last Congress, we passed a law that barred private insurers from making coverage decisions based on these guidelines through at least 2018. However, the moratorium did not apply to the VA, and so women in their 40s could have been denied mammograms. To its credit, the VA recently changed its guideline when we pointed this out regarding screening, and with your support today, language is included to hold the VA to this better standard. The military construction portion of this bill is funded at $1.8 billion above last year's enacted level, providing adequate funding for both the active and reserve components. We were also pleased to see that the bill provides $35 million above the FY 2018 budget request for the base realignment and closure account to help expedite the cleanup of former Defense Department sites. The bill funds the NATO Security Investment Program at the FY17 level, sending a strong message to our nation's allies that we stand with them as we continue to face evolving international threats. For the Department of Veterans Affairs, this bill provides $3.9 billion above the FY2017 enacted level, a 5.3 percent increase over F FY2017. The MARC also fully funds the FY2018 second bite of the apple, $2.6 billion, which brings the total amount provided for VA medical care to $69 billion, which is a 6.8 percent increase over FY 2017 enacted. Very few agencies will be able to say that they fared this well during the, what I think history will call the budget cap years. Speaking of which, Mr. Chairman, you and I have had a lot of discussions regarding the FY 2018 budget and what the Budget Control Act caps mean for our committee's work. Mr. Chairman, while I believe this is a good allocation for the FY 2018 Milcon VA bill, I am concerned what this allocation means for the other bills. The Budget Control Act reduces our FY 2018 committee's 302A from $1.070 trillion to $1.065 trillion, a $2 billion reduction on the defense side and $3 billion on the non-defense side. To put this into perspective, in FY 2010, the committee's 302A allocation was $1.09 trillion. We were actually lower than where we were in FY 2010. With this, we are clearly starting off in a hole, a deep one, in fact. Additionally, as I mentioned, we have yet to hear from the majority on this year's 302A and corresponding 302Bs for each bill. Mr. Chairman, at this point, I hope and believe we all recognize that the BCA was a terrible policy decision and one which we must address in order to return to regular order and bring some stability to the appropriations process. I believe it's the only way for this committee to get back to regular order is to work together and get rid of the BCA caps. 
If we do not address this issue, we will yet again experience another summer in which we fail to pass all 12 bills through the House and ultimately must pass a CR causing further strain on the federal government. Mr. Chairman, it is clear that a solution will require a bipartisan majority of both houses. I believe every member of this committee is ready to work and do the right thing. I believe it's time we get past these unrealistic beliefs that we can cut our way to prosperity. If this failed philosophy persists, our work and our mandate will only get tougher. We must be more strategic about how we handle our federal budget. This committee's work becomes even more difficult as we must balance the needs of the VA with the other federal agencies. And I think we can agree, hope we can agree, that it is time to cre start, stop creating these artificial crises. Mr. Chairman, these markups represent the first step in a long process. Democrats stand ready to work with you to address these issues as we move forward in the appropriations process. And I yield back. Thank you for your comments. Actually, thank you, uh, both of you, for your comments uh, and for your joint commitment for to providing for our troops, their families, and veterans uh, through your bill. We're coming out of the starting gate uh, with a very important bill, Military Construction and Veterans Affairs. This is a solid bill that reflects our chief priority as members of Congress to provide for a strong national defense. The foundation of a strong national defense is a well-supported military force who serve our country with a guarantee they'll be cared for when they retire from active duty or become disabled defending our nation and their families as well. The funding provided in this legislation, totaling $88.8 billion in discretionary funding, will continue the rebuilding of our national security, ensuring our troops have the resources they need to conduct such successful missions and keep our nation secure. As Chairman Dent has highlighted, the bill provides $10.2 billion for construction and maintenance of facilities and resources that will support our troops in their missions at home and abroad. This funding, a 25 percent increase over current levels, reflects the goal of the White House and our caucus, and I'm sure of just about everybody in this room, to support and sustain programs that ensure that our troops are ready to fight, which is absolutely imperative as we rebuild and grow our military force. This bill also targets funding for critical construction projects across the world, wherever our military is, at home or abroad. It supports the quality of life for our troops so they can rest assured that they and their families are being taken care of throughout their entire service. For the Department of Veterans Affairs, the bill includes $78.3 billion, ensuring our veterans who sacrificed so much in the name of the, of the United States receive the services and benefits they've earned. This total includes a nearly 7 percent increase for, for funding for medical care at the VA. These funds will be treated be used to treat mind, the mind and body of our veterans, including mental health services, suicide prevention, traumatic uh, brain injury treatment, opioid abuse prevention, and assistance for homeless veterans. With the welcome news that the VA is, is finally embarking on a new effort for a joint health records keeping system with the Department of Defense, I'm pleased that uh, Mr. Dent's bill addresses ongoing issues related to its implementation and encourages a responsive, cost-effective transition. It's long overdue. This legislation also addresses other issues plaguing the administration, including the benefit appeals backlog. As the number of claims increase and grows more complex, it's critical that we provide adequate funding to help reduce this back backlog and track progress on the issue. I'm proud this bill makes investments that address these and other challenges, like closing service loopholes, improving efficiency through technology, and implementing thorough oversight to ensure that every dollar spent at the VA goes directly to the improved care of our veterans. I'd like to thank uh, Chairman Dent and rank Ranking Member Wasserman Schultz for their, and their subcommittees members and our remarkable professional staff uh, which is behind me, both uh, uh, our bar it's bipartisan staff in every sense, for their commitment to all the brave men and women who wear or have worn our nation's uniform. Uh, I'd be happy at this point to recognize my ranking member, Ms. Lowy, for any comments. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. It's a pleasure working with you and this committee. 
If we were considering the military construction and veteran affairs bill in a vacuum, this would be a good bill at $88.8 .8 billion in discretionary funding, a $6 billion increase over the fiscal year 2017 enacted level. This bill would fund critical services veterans rely upon, including $1.7 billion to address veteran homelessness, $8.4 billion for mental health services, and $2.89 billion for the Veterans Benefits Administration. In addition, I am pleased that the VA has announced it will follow DOD in pursuing the same electronic health record system, a priority in which I have, on which I have focused for several years. In fact, Chairman Rogers and I worked on this together four years or more. Fencing funds until the VA can provide a plan on purchasing that system is the responsible course of action. The current system is simply unacceptable. We owe the men and women who serve this country the best treatment possible, and it is my hope that recent steps coupled with our oversight will lead to an improved VA healthcare system. Unfortunately, we just don't have the luxury to consider funding for some parts of the government without considering the effects of spending policy on government as a whole. The veterans we seek to assist in this bill will also be harmed if other appropriation bills cut essential programs like job training, elderly and disabled housing, and child care programs. Cuts to the federal workforce across the government are a direct threat to veterans who made up 30.9% of the federal workforce in FY15. 30.9% of the federal workforce. Mr. Chairman, while I appreciate the work on this bill, make no mistake, this committee will not return to regular order without addressing the budget caps as we have done every year since sequestration became law. Our commitment to our men and women in uniform, senior citizens, working mothers cannot be met under the current budget caps, which would cut $5 billion from defense and non-defense bills. I urge the chairman to bring your leadership and the White House to the negotiating table and work with Democrats to raise the budget caps. So I want to thank the chairman, ranking members, for their work on this bill. I look forward to continuing discussions with them as the bill progresses. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Ms. Lowy. Uh, any uh, other general comments? Uh, Mr. Bishop, recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, today, as a former ranking member of the military, uh, construction VA subcommittee. I'm proud uh, that the Appropriations Committee comes together in a bipartisan fashion uh, to meet the needs of our service members, our veterans, and their families. I congratulate Chairman Dent uh, and Ranking Member Debbie Wasserman Schultz on crafting a very good bill. Uh, this bill takes necessary steps to provide the armed forces with the facilities needed to provide our military families with support wherever our troops work, train, and live. I'm pleased that the bill provides a total of $202.9 million for military construction needs in Georgia. Uh, this includes $10.8 million for a new air traffic control tower at Fort Benning uh, to support mission readiness, which is the Army's number one construction priority. The bill also includes $43.3 million in funding to repair damage to the Marine Corps Logistics Base in Albany uh, which was struck by severe storms and tornadoes last January. I believe this bill would be beneficial to both our armed forces and our veterans, and I'm hopeful 
that is preserved as the House considers amendments and as it moves through the process. Uh, while there are many things uh, to praise about this bill, Mr. Chairman, I'm not particularly pleased that we are now eight months into the fiscal year uh, without a budget and an agreed upon discretionary spending levels. Uh, marking up one discretionary bill at a time without a sense of the whole is careless, and we owe it to the American people to do better. We need sound investments in education, in health, nutrition, and the other non-defense elements to effectively raise and sustain the world's greatest military. Service members must be educated, healthy, and well-fed to perform the many demands that we place on them. While this bill invests in the critical tools that our military and our veterans need, our non-defense discretionary programs are equally important for our national defense. And so with that said, Mr. Chairman, uh, I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you, Mr. Bishop. Any uh, further discussion? Oh, oh, Mr. Young, excuse me, David Young. Mr. Chairman, uh, Ranking Member and uh, the Chair and the Ranking Member of the Subcommittee, I want to thank you for your commitment to the mental health issues in this bill for our veterans, particularly what's going on with the Veterans Crisis Line. You know, we learned last year through the Government Accountability Office and the VA, VA's Inspector General that the President signed into law, President Obama, a bill that we got passed in a bipartisan manner in Congress, the No Veterans Crisis Line call should go on an unanswered act. It demanded accountability based on the recommendations from the GAO and the VA's Inspector General. So thank you for the commitment with further reporting language, funding. Uh, it's, not always fu it's not always funding, we know. It demands accountability, and we need to make sure that we have accountability with the VA uh, because the VA needs to be accountable to our veterans. And so I want to thank everybody here for not just my request and making sure this was funded at an adequate, if not better, level, but I know a lot of you as well did. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Young. Ms. Kaptur. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Let me extend my thanks, uh, as others have, to Chairman Dent and to Ranking Member Wasserman Schultz for producing a bill uh, that is uh, admirable despite the budget fog in which we seem to exist. Uh, the VA is uh, one of America's most important institutions and provides vital services to the men and women who put their lives on the line for us uh, every day. There's no question we have a moral obligation to them uh, in perpetuity. I'm pleased to see that the uh, chairman's mark includes $78 billion in funding, including $3.9 billion more than the 2017 level. Uh, we have to remember we've been at war for 16 years. The costs of this are huge. The increase of $1.5 million for the VA general administration is a good step in setting the framework to help our veterans, and the VA has and is, uh, has proven and is the best way to promote veterans' quality of life. They're getting better at it every day with our help. In addition uh, to caring for veterans, the VA also has a tremendous economic impact on the communities in which we exist. Uh, they provide uh, enormous support for medical education and, uh, frankly, good-paying 21st century jobs. The VA is the largest hospital system. Uh, in the United States, and I would dare say the world, and it has a lifetime relationship with 9 million patients as we sit here today who can receive all kinds of physical care as well as psychosocial care, uh, pharmacy access, integrated mental health care, as others have referenced, and geriatric care at more than 1,200 health care facilities and communities across our country, employing over 350,000 uh, individuals with affiliations with 1,800 uh, academic institutions. If you've never seen some of what the VA is inventing, uh, go back and read the history of the magnetic resonance imaging machine. Beyond health care, VA offers veterans a wide variety of other essential <coughs> services, including career services, vocational training, continued education, fiduciary management, pension resources, disability compensation, home loan guarantees, insurance, and many others. In fact, our veteran centers have become wellness centers. Overall, the VA is a core foundation stone of our society and should be given the ability to fulfill its intended mission. And I thank my colleagues for their strong support and yield back. Thank you, Ms. Kaptur. Any other uh, general discussion by any members? Uh, if there's no further discussion, are, are there any amendments? Uh, Mr. Chairman, I have an amendment at the desk. Thank you. 
An amendment offered by Sir, Mr. Dent. I, I move to uh, the bill dispense with the reading of the amendment. Consider it done. Um, the amendment's amendment, uh, which you have before you, consists of uh, non-controversial bill language um, and, uh, and also some uh, report language items that have been agreed to by both sides of the aisle. There are, there are four uh, minor bill language changes and 12 pieces of uh, report language, and we were able to reach agreement on everything that committee members asked us to do on this matter. Uh, I think members have had a chance to look through the package that's on your desk, so uh, I move the amendment as adopted. Uh, amendment's been moved. Uh, the question is on the amendment. Uh, any comments, uh, Ms. Wasserman Schultz? Just that we appreciate the opportunity to work with the chairman and we support the amendment. Thank you very much. Uh, the question is on the amendment. Any further discussion? Mr. Yes, uh, Mr. Judge Carter. Mr. Chairman, I'd like to rise to thank both sides for including the, the uh, language on this organ donation policy in the VA. It's a, it became an issue in my district, and when I learned about it, it seemed like it needed to be looked at hardly in a hard fashion, and you've done that. Thank you very much. Any other comments on the manager's amendment? And the questions on the amendment, all those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed? Uh, I guess uh, the, the motion, uh, in my opinion, uh, ha has been approved, uh, and the amendment is agreed to. Thank you. Uh, any uh, further amendments? Yes, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Ms. Wasserman Schultz. I have an amendment at the desk. And I ask unanimous consent that the reading of the amendment be dispensed with. Absolutely. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Approximately 20 years, excuse me, approximately 20 veterans, as I mentioned, die from suicide every day. One tool used by the VA to combat high suicide rates and help those who are considering suicide is the Veterans Crisis Line, a 24-hour toll-free hotline that veterans can call to connect to a responder trained in crisis management. As you heard me mention in my opening statement, we were pleased that the bill includes robust funding to address suicide prevention. Furthermore, the bill repeats language first included in the fiscal year 2017 bill, requiring the VCL to provide to individuals who contact the hotline immediate assistance from a trained professional and to adhere to all requirements of the American Association of Suicidology. The funding and the bill language are vital pieces in helping, VA com helping the VA combat veteran suicide. However, in January, President Trump implemented a hiring freeze across the federal government, which was lifted on April 12, 2017. Conversely, Secretary Shulkin chose to continue the hiring freeze to, as he said then, get rid of the bloat at VA. In implementing his hiring freeze, he exempted employees who work at VA medical centers and implemented a waiver process for all other provisions. During a briefing with the VCL director to discuss suicide prevention training protocols at the VA, I learned that waivers are required to hire counselors for vacant positions at the VCL and that the VCL plans to fill 409 positions in FY 2018. The VCL director assured me that Undersecretary Allay has approved these waivers whenever they come across her desk. But I find that this additional bureaucratic process for approval unacceptable for roles as critical as these are. The amendment before you today merely exempts vacant positions at the VCL from the freeze and allows VA to fill those positions quickly and give the VA the proper staffing levels to help veterans in crisis. I know we're all committed to making sure that when a veteran in crisis place a call, places a call to the VCL, there's someone to answer. The VCL staff is vital to helping veterans get the help they need, and VCL staff should not be affected by any hiring freeze. Lives are literally at stake, and we need to clear the obstacles out of the way so that we can make sure these counselors can get to veterans and veterans in crisis can get to the counselors. And I urge my colleagues' adoption of the amendment. Ms. Wasserman, Ms. Phil, thank you for your comments, Mr. Dent. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I just want to say quickly, I understand that the suicide hotline is having trouble hiring new staff as, as quickly as it, sh as it should to improve uh, its service to callers who could be in, in desperate need of help. Uh, this is uh, due to headquarters policy that require each hire to be approved centrally. Uh, I support this amendment so we can help the crisis line increase its capacity and responsiveness uh, without having uh, uh, to fight bureaucratic obstacles. Uh, we're prepared to accept this amendment. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Dan. Any further discussion? There'd be no further discussion. Yes, excuse me, Mr. Serrano, recognized. Amendment for a second. But in all honesty, in getting up and supporting the amendment, I want to abuse somewhat the privilege of the uh, committee by saying something I should have said uh, during general debate. And that is, no, Jose, Joe. <laughs> you said Mike? Uh, 
I try that joke every year and it gets the same amount of laughs. I don't know how many of you are aware of this, but in the territories, the quality and the programs available to veterans at the VA are not the same as they are in the 50 states. And I think it's something we should all pay attention to. I can understand, as painful as it is, the argument about a territory versus a state and voting for president and federal programs and so on. But when it comes to the VA, there should be no difference. A veteran in Puerto Rico, a veteran in the Virgin Islands should have the same access to the same kind of programs available to a veteran in any other state. Because when they get sent out, they don't get sent out based on where they come from. They get sent out to the military action or the posts that they have to go to. So please, keep that in the back of your head and, and make it part, perhaps, of your behavior pro-veteran in the future. Thank you. Any uh, further comments on the amendment uh, yield to Ms. Wasserman Schultz to close? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just my appreciation that we continue to recognize what a critical crisis this is. 22 veterans a day commit suicide, and anything we can do to clear the obstacles from between them and getting the help they need is, is essential. So I appreciate the, the chairman and the colleague, my colleague's support. Thank you. Any uh, for, uh, questions on the amendment? All those in favor say aye. Uh, those opposed say nay. Uh, it appears, in my opinion, the ayes have it. The amendment is agreed to. Any further amendments? Ms. Lee, excuse me. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have an amendment at the desk, Lee Amendment Number 1. The clerk will read. Number an amendment offered by Ms. Lee at the end of the Title II. Red. Thank you. Ms. Lee. Thank, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, this amendment is very simple. It uh, prohibits the use of funds in this bill to establish a White House Veterans Complaint Hotline. Now, it's unclear to me and my colleagues how this new hotline will be used and how it will be integrated with the other 975 hotlines already in operation in the VA. That's 975. The VA has been in the process of consolidating the current excess of hotlines to reduce the frustration and the confusion that veterans feel when trying to contact the agency for help. This hotline will only further confuse veterans and potentially add dangerous delays when the contractors running the hotline have to refer callers to another office in the VA. And so we share a concern also about waste, fraud, and abuse at the VA. And I don't want um, our precious VA dollars to, find, to fund duplica duplicative hotlines that will really only uh, delay timely services to veterans. So I ask for a yes vote on this amendment and yield back. Thank you, Ms. Lee. Uh, Mr. Dent, Chairman Dent. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I, I do understand that there is some uh, skepticism about the, the new White House hotline as articulated by our friend and colleague, uh, Ms. Lee, but I, I think we really should uh, just give it a chance to reach full operation uh, and see what impact it's having uh, in, in giving veterans an opportunity to voice their, uh, their concerns. Uh, we have included a strong report language uh, on the hotline on page 69, you can read it, uh, requiring additional information on its operation as the program is set up to, to judge how much activity it's generating, how well uh, it, it might be serving our, our veterans. Uh, and based, based on actual data, uh, we will be well positioned in conference uh, to make a final determination about funding it. So I, so for the moment, for the moment, uh, I would suggest that we give the hotline a chance to uh, prove its worth and I would urge my uh, colleagues to uh, reject or oppose this amendment. Thank you. You're back. Thank you, Ms. Dent. Any further comments by member Ms. Wasserman Schultz? Oh, yes. excuse me. Yeah, oh, no, go ahead. Uh, Mr. Young, excuse me. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I rise in opposition to my colleagues' um, amendment. I went down three weeks ago to Atlanta to the Veterans Crisis Line Center to see how the call center was doing, uh, part of our oversight responsibilities. While meeting there with um, the crisis line responders, many of whom are veterans and have backgrounds in mental health, more and more of them are. Uh, I talked to Susan Strickland, the acting uh, Veterans Crisis Line Director, and David Carroll, the Executive Director of Mental Health Operations for the VA Health Administration. They get a lot of calls to the Veterans Crisis Line that have nothing to do with the emotional 
and mental war wounds that are going on with our veterans. And so many calls have become a distraction to the sole purpose of why the VCL, the Veterans Crisis Line, is there. And they say that any other uh, resources out there for veterans that can be made available will help free up those lines for those veterans with those real emotional war wounds. And so I, I rise to um, oppose this amendment, and I thank the chairman. I yield back. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Young. Uh, Ms. Wasserman Schultz. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I rise in support of the general lady from California's amendment. Uh, respectfully to my colleague, Mr. Young, um, adding another hotline for veterans to call and directing them anywhere other than to the VA, where you have the most uh, direct ability to assist them with whatever it is they're calling about, doesn't make any sense. Uh, this White House assistance line is for veterans is not a crisis line. Uh, it's just actually taking them further away from the likely place that is best able to help them. Um, frankly, I'm concerned about the politicization of communication with veterans and making sure that we can keep their needs housed within the appropriate department at the VA and continue to encourage the VA, frankly, Mr. Chairman, to dramatically narrow the number of contact points, not expand the number of contact points that veterans have so that we can get them quicker access to the services that they need. Adding another layer and sending them to the White House is not the way to do that, and I support the gentlelady's amendment. Thank you, Ms. Wasserman. So, it's any other comments on the Lee Amendment? Uh, Ms. Lee, you're recognized to close, if you wish. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Let me uh, be clear about a couple of things. First of all, uh, these hotlines uh, don't, do not only address issues around mental health. They address benefits, health insurance, cemeteries, women's issues, of course, suicide crisis, debt management, whistleblower issues. And uh, the sheer number, 975 now, of call lines, it makes it very difficult for veterans to navigate uh, the hotlines and to get the services that they need without delay. Uh, there are many, many questions that need answering. For instance, we don't know the source and the size of funding required to operate the hotline. Uh, who the staff will be answering the calls? Will it be VA employees? Will it be contract employees? Uh, what call volume is expected? What hours the hotline will be available? Where it will be located, of course, we know uh, it's indicated to be somewhere in the White House. Uh, how operators plan uh, to channel calls to agency staff with the necessary expertise, and really what performance measures are built into its operation. And so I am urging, and I vote on this, the veterans, uh, again, do not need any more, um, any more, I'd, I'd say obstruction, <laughs> really, in terms of trying to navigate the system. 975 um, lines are a lot, and the VA is trying right now to consolidate them, not expand them, so I would ask for an I vote. Thank you, Ms. Lee. Uh, Mr. Chairman, what? I wasn't going to get involved in this. But Ms. Captor uh, is recognized. Thank, thank you. I wasn't going to get involved in this issue, but um, uh, I support the gentlelady's amendment. Let me ask the question. If it's a White House office, what's it doing in this bill? I want to ask a jurisdictional question. Uh, doesn't it belong in the financial services I'd subject? I'd be happy to yield to Mr. Dent. Thank you. <laughs> uh, if it's a White House function. White, White House initiated, but it is within VA. Okay. It, it, this, honestly, I don't think this is a good idea. Having worked at a White House on a domestic policy staff, and having fielded calls, I don't know who thunk up this idea, but honestly, I can tell you this from having experience with the VA hotlines dealing with suicide, uh, we had trouble even getting real human beings to answer those phones. And uh, this White House, because they're just getting started, has been difficult to get through when people call. People don't answer the phones over there. You're lucky to get an email maybe. Uh, be able to register an email, not that you get an answer back. So there's a lot of instability in terms of startups there, and I think, I think the White House can do anything it wants with veterans, but not, and they can, you know, say that they have their office in domestic policy, let people call in there, but don't make it a part of, of this budget. I think this is a very slippery track that we're on, and we've had trouble getting those suicide hotlines and those VA counseling hotlines started and properly staffed 
uh, with individuals to handle vets. I can't tell you how many vets from my district tried to call one of those lines for help and they couldn't get another human being on the line under the VA. To put it over at the White House, I would say, to the, I would say this to the gentleman, I'd be willing to consider this as a floor amendment uh, if we get to the floor with this bill and do a little more research on this, but I would advise every mm -hmm. member, call the White House when you leave here and see if you can get through. Okay. <laughs> I yield uh, back. Okay. Thank, thank you, Ms. Kaplan. The question's on the amendment. Heads up. All those in favor, say aye. Aye. All those opposed, say nay. No. The, 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 in my opinion, the nays have, uh, have it. The amendment is not agreed to. Uh, any uh, Further amendments before I recognize Mr. Dent. Any further amendments? Mr. Dent is recognized. Mr. Chairman, I just uh, I wanted to take a moment to uh, thank our staff here. Uh, I neglected to do that in my opening remarks, but I wanted to acknowledge uh, behind me Maureen Hollihan, uh, Sue Quantius, uh, Sarah Young, Tracy Russell over there in red, and uh, Matt Washington on the minority staff. Thank them all for their very good uh, bipartisan work. They're very effective, and they, they worked on this bill very quickly and uh, under some interesting circumstances. And with that, I'd like to yield to the, uh, the ranking member. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I associate myself with the chairman's remarks and we'll go ahead and repeat. Matt Washington, Rosalind Kumar, Jonathan Steinberg, Sarah Young, Maureen Hallahan, Sue Quantius, Tracy Russell, and Sean Snyder, your staff person, yeah. Mr. Chairman, <laughs> for, uh, for their great work on helping us get to this day. <laughs> uh, thank you. Uh, and I do recognize Sean Snyder and Rosalind as well. <laughs> for, uh, I had it right in front of me, but thank you, and uh, I yield back. Thank you. Uh, needless to say, we have the best staff in the world, and we're proud of uh, all of them. Uh, are there any affirm further amendments? If there are no further amendments, I recognize Mr. Rogers for a motion and ask for your support of this important legislation. Mr. Rogers. Mr. Chairman, I move to favorably report the Military Construction and Veterans Affairs Appropriations Bill for fiscal year 2018 to the House. Th thank you, Mr. Rogers. The question is on, on the bill. All those in favor say aye. aye. All those opposed say nay. Uh, the ayes, in my opinion, uh, uh, have it. And the amendment is agreed to. Don't disappear because we have to do some, uh, uh, some materials on the 302B allocations. Uh, uh, our second and final order of business this afternoon is consideration of the interim 302B allocation for the Military Construction and Veterans Affairs Appropriations Committee. Although the House has yet to approve a budget resolution for fiscal year 2018, this report follows the intent of Section 302B of the Congressional Budget Act and helps facilitate floor action on this bill whenever that may be. I'm optimistic that we'll, we will soon have an approved budget resolution that will provide us with a top line number for 2018 fiscal year. In the meantime, this committee will continue to move forward and fulfill our constitutional responsibility. I urge you to support the interim sub-allocation sub for this critical bill that supports our national security, our troops, and our veterans. And I'm pleased to recognize Ms. Lowy for uh, any comments she may have. Last month, Congress passed the 2017 Omnibus. Well, seven months late, it was yet another example of our committee writing spending bills that get broad bipartisan support and include a number of priorities for all members. That is why, Mr. Chairman, I am so disheartened that on the heels of that very important bipartisan victory, the majority has already abandoned regular order without a full slate of subcommittee allocations for the 2018 bills. We will instead stumble from one bill to another with Republicans who control the House, Senate, and White House, trying to hide from the American public the funding levels for each bill and the price hardworking families will pay for the increases to bills we consider first. It really is outrageous. It is inexcusable that the party in charge is so dysfunctional and so lacks transparency. Time and time again, Democrats have helped pass responsible spending legislation. 
And I think we're all very proud of the work we did together in a bipartisan way on the 2017 bill. My friends, the existing caps for defense and non-defense, which are scheduled to go down by a total of $5 billion this year, are insufficient to meet this country's growing needs. Democrats cannot help pass appropriation bills that jeopardize investments in working families and local communities. The majority must provide information as to the direction we are headed. What is our top line allocation? How will that be divided between defense and non-defense? What is the majority's plan to avoid sequestration? Given the compressed calendar, Will the committee pass all 12 bills out of committee and consider them on the floor? Will the House consider one bill at a time or an omnibus package? Will allocations reflect the Trump budget, remember the skinny budget, that betrays hardworking Americans? I'd be happy to yield my remaining time to the chairman or any Republican mem member who can answer these questions. From press accounts, we are either awaiting a partisan omnibus bill before August or writing a year-long CR. No response then we can only interpret the majority's silence. Oh, would you like to respond? I, I, I thank, thank you for your comments, and I'm just wondering whether anyone else has any comments that uh, would like to follow you so we can uh, move on this allocation uh, motion. Yes, I do. You want to come? Well, then let me conclude, and then we can turn to some other people, because it seems to me by the information before us, we can only interpret the majority silence as an acceptance of the Trump ideology which promotes cutting housing, cancer research, job training, meals for the elderly, Medicare, and so much more. Thank you, Ms. Lowy. Ms. Wasserman Schultz, recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Thank Chairman. You. The Milcon VA bill, once again, as I said, has a good 302B allocation. It continues to provide the Department of Veterans Affairs with the resources it needs to support our nation's veterans, as well as our military personnel currently serving. However, Mr. Chairman, we do not legislate in a vacuum, and this bill has ramifications far beyond the funding levels for each of these important accounts. Mr. Chairman, slow rolling allocation sends a strong signal to every member of this committee that $1.065 trillion is not enough to meet the discretionary needs of this committee, as well as making it crystal clear that we can no longer function under the Budget Control Act caps. The 302B allocation for Mil Milcon VA will have an impact on the 302Bs for the 11 other bills. And while the majority has favored these interim allocations, as they say, they are completely irresponsible. Furthermore, without knowing the individual allocations that set forth in the Budget Control Act, we are left to rely on the President's cruel and inhuman budget proposal as an indication of what the majority, majority's bills may look like. As I pointed out during my opening remarks, the FY 2018 VA budget is $3.9 billion above last year, yet the BCA cap for non-defense discretionary funding decreases by $3 billion, which equates to a $7 billion hole in the Committee's 302A. Representing South Florida, where hurricane season began this month, how can I decide on the Milcon VA allocations without knowing how critical agencies for the safety of my constituents will fare in the disposition of other bills? Now, while we haven't seen the 302B for CJS yet, I know the President's budget would eviscerate accounts like the National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Agency. And every member has a picture uh, in front of you that is in a condominium apartment just after Hurricane Wilma unexpectedly came from west to east, the opposite direction that hurricanes usually travel in Florida, crashing down on our heads and literally causing this constituent of mine's roof to cave in on his bed. 
This is what many, many, ha what happened to many, many people in my district. And as you can see, it takes just one major storm to completely upend our lives and cause emotional and financial heartbreak. That's why I simply can't understand how President Trump could release a budget that contains devastating cuts to NOAA. This proposal not only reduces investments in weather forecasting technology, but it also cuts programs that would enhance our understanding of hurricanes and tornadoes. NOAA's weather satellite programs, which are so vital to South Florida's disaster preparedness, would see reductions in the hundreds of millions of dollars. Furthermore, Mr. Chairman, I'm concerned that if we use the BCA allocation for FY 2018, it will have the same impact as the Trump budget. South Florida residents are never safe from storms. We have seen the devastation of hurricanes like Andrew and Wilma, and while we can never prevent them, we must prepare for them. And NOAA is helping us do that. NOAA is helping keep, keep people out of harm's way sooner, and that preparation can and will save lives. And as you can see, colleagues, our committee cannot function at the budget cap levels, nor can we operate under President Trump's budget numbers. Under both of these, those scenarios, we are setting ourselves up for failure, and we've set ourselves up for a long summer and early fall with no real progress to be made on the FY18 appropriations. With that, it's inevitable that a continuing resolution, or a series of them, will be needed to keep the government open and running in place long past the new fiscal year's start on October 1st. Colleagues, we cannot continue to govern in this fashion. We know you had to think about the other allocations when deciding on the Milcon VA allocation. And in order to budget responsibly, we will continue to insist that you release all of the 302B allocations so we can make decisions in totality rather than in a vacuum. Thank you, and I yield back. Thank you, Ms. Wasserman Schultz. Who's next? Mr. Kilmer. Thank you, Chairman. Um, and I, I just want to say, I, I, I say this res with respect to the chairman and with an acknowledgement that some of the issues we're talking about don't simply fall uh, within the jurisdiction of this committee, that we're waiting on uh, some others as well. But I, I don't think this approach makes sense. I mean, many of us uh, in our families make a family budget, and we sit down and we look at what our overall expenses are going to be, and we don't look at one item in a vacuum. You know, we go through what's our budget going to be for food, and what's our mortgage payment going to be? And what are our utilities payment going to be? What are we going to do for fun on a Friday night if we ever uh, get fun on a Friday night? We don't look at each one of those items in a vacuum because we might blow the budget on one thing without knowing what their other resources are going to needs are going to be. My constituents absolutely care about military veterans, and I, I support that, this bill for that reason. But my constituents also care about making sure their kids get a good education. My kids also, uh, my constituents also care that we have a workable earthquake early warning system so that if an earthquake hits, people are safe. My constituents want to make sure that our roads and bridges are safe, that they can get goods and services to market. And to simply take specific appropriations bills in a vacuum without actually thinking through what is our budget, what are all of our expenses going to be, doesn't make any sense. And so I, I just say to, to, to my colleagues, I think we need a budget. You know, I, I, I don't know if these numbers are the right numbers. I think what's important is we have to look at this in a comprehensive way and have a much smarter approach. That's what we do in my family. That's what my constituents do in their families, and that's their expectation of this Congress. And with that, Chairman, Thank I yield Mr. Back. Kilmer, Ms. Orwell, Allard, <laughs> recognized, and then Mr. Serrano. Mr. Chairman, uh, as the ranking member on the Homeland Security Committee, I too want to express my concern about the fact that we have just marked up a bill without a budget and without knowing what the impact will be on the other subcommittee bills. This is like a family deciding to add an addition to their home without knowing how much money they have in their account or knowing what the impact is going to be on their ability to meet their other financial obligations. Anyone in this room would consider such an action to be reckless and irresponsible. Yet that is exactly what we have been asked to do today. How is it possible that we, as members of Congress, as members of this Appropriations Committee, responsible for seeing the overseeing the spending of taxpayer dollars, are being asked to approve allocations for a single bill without knowing the budget we are working within and without any knowledge of the impact it will have on the other important bills that fund our government and support the American people. I therefore join with others 
in objecting to the lack of transparency and the absence of regular order. As we approve this interim sub-allocation to the FY 2018 Military Construction and Veterans Affairs Bill. I hope, Mr. Chairman, that you will reconsider and provide us with all the information that we need to make responsible funding decisions on behalf of our constituents and on behalf of the American taxpayer. I yield back. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Serrano is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. First of all, I want to take a brief moment to uh, join all of our colleagues in wishing the best of Godspeed to all the people who were injured yesterday. This is something that continues to be on our mind, something that continues to affect all of us. And I wish I could rise for some other reason today, but even in the wake of this tragedy, I must express serious concerns about the piecemeal approach to our subcommittee allocation process. While the Milcon bill was treated very well today, we're all left in the dark about our bills and priorities. Our other 11 subcommittees deserve to know what cuts and increases they may be dealing with in fiscal year 2018. I sincerely hope this is not a case of the majority keeping our side in the dark. This is not the traditional way the Appropriations <coughs> Committee has conducted business. It undermines the ability of this committee to do its job in a fair and bipartisan manner. As of now, the only Republican budget on display is the one proposed by the President. That request proposes to cut $54 billion from not defense discretionary spending. The American people deserve to know whether the majority intends to try and implement the President's devastating budget request or not. As the ranking member of the CJS subcommittee, I want to point out that President Trump's proposed budget would do to many agencies. His proposal would hurt STEM programs, NOAA, NASA, the Department of Justice would be cut by more than $300 million, including eliminating body-worn cameras. But you know, the biggest problem here, Mr. Chairman, is what may happen to you. This may become a lobbying effort where everybody says this, it's one bill at a time, please let me go next. And that's what we have before us. If you go next, you may get a larger amount than the guys and gals at the end. And so, can Mr. Cobbleson and I go next? <laughs> Any further comments? Uh, 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 Rosa DeLauro, Ms. DeLauro. Oh, we had somebody over there. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. And um, I, I really, before I make my comment, I just want to say I really am glad that we are marking up the bill uh, today and that we're continuing our work together, uh, continuing the work that we are charged with doing for the uh, for the American people. I think yesterday's events uh, really shook all of us. Uh, we pray for our colleague, for Steve. We pray for the others who were injured. We think very carefully and with great solicitation about their families and what they're going through uh, at, at the moment, and our hearts are, are with them. Uh, we are one house, uh, and we are a family, uh, and we do debate. And that is what the spirit is of this uh, great institution, uh, which is why I, too, as um, uh, some of my other colleagues, I, I express disappointment that this year the committee is repeating the trend of approving interim 302B allocations one at a time. This is not the regular order uh, that is so often talked about uh, by our colleagues on the other side of the aisle as we say that we are trying to do and get in, getting to all the bills. Um, and it is irresponsible for us to move forward in this fashion. We should not be marking up any bill in this committee until we have a complete picture of what the overall spending plan is, uh, as well as the sub-allocations for all of the funding bills. That is the regular order. And to date, we don't even have a budget resolution. Are the other bills not as important as military construction and veterans affairs? What about Homeland Security? What about defense? Does the people's bill, labor, education, health, and human services, not deserve the same consideration? 
What about our children's education, our mental health services, our job training programs to close the skills gap? Mr. Chairman, I understand that putting together a budget is very complicated and that you are operating under serious political constraints, but we cannot solve this problem by avoiding it. I am deeply concerned <laughs> that we will shortchange the Labor HHS Education Appropriations Bill, which represents 31% of non-defense discretionary of that budget because we are circumventing regular order in this way. And I don't say that lightly because that has continued to happen uh, in the past. That's what Labor HHS has experienced over the last several years. We do not know what kind of constraints, we hope none, uh, will be placed on our subcommittees regarding offsets and CHIMS. If we saw the entire plan being put forward, we may decide that we need to provide additional resources for veterans and military construction. What criteria was applied to come up with this number? We may see that the plan would shortchange other bills, but today no member of this committee can answer the question. I urge the committee to vote for a transparent, a legitimate allocation process by saying no to the proposed 302Bs. And I urge the majority to put all of the cards on the table, show us the plan for labor, health, education, and yes, for all the other subcommittees. Thank you, Mr. Thank Chairman. Thank you. Uh, yes, Ms. McCollum, I think you were up ahead of Mr. Bishop and then Ms. Ms. Lee. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, as, as my colleagues have been pointing out, this committee is now operating in the dark regarding how we appropriate the nearly $1 trillion for the remaining 11 appropriation bills. As has been pointed out, the Budget Committee has not produced a budget. Providing appropriators, providing us, they have a responsibility to do that, a 302 allocation. They just haven't done their job. Today's milk on VA bill increases spending by $6 billion over fiscal year 2017. The defense appropriation bill could be in the subcommittee by the end of the month, I've heard. What number is that bill being drafted at? $550 billion? $600 billion? $700 billion? I don't know. But I do know that President Trump's bu budget gutted domestic spending across the board, families, communities, main streets. Is this committee's intention to accept those devastating cuts to Interior, T-HUD, and Labor HHS? I've heard not, but I haven't heard what the intention is. This is a bipartisan committee, one I'm very proud to be a member of, and I really do appreciate and hold dear the friendships I share with my Republican colleagues. I want to work with you. Democrats want to work with you. But we want to advance bills that keep our country strong, our constituents safe, and to make America more successful. But we can't do it by operating in the dark. And we shouldn't do it without an open, transparent process. As recent history clearly demonstrates, the Republican majority cannot pass an appropriation bill without the full support of the Democrats. Mr. Chairman, I stand ready to work with you. You've always been fair. You've always been thoughtful. It's the best interest of our committee that we do our work and we do it with transparency and we do it with accountability with allocations for all the subcommittees. I yield back. Thank you, Ms. McCullough. Mr. Bishop is recognized. Uh, thank you for yielding, Mr. Chairman. Uh, it's the middle of June. We still have no budget resolution, no top line spending number, and the debt limit is rapidly approaching and we have no full list of subcommittee allocations. Marking up just one bill at a time without a full list of the allocations leaves us effectively working in the dark. Without a bipartisan budget deal, we'll also be forced to cope with the return of sequestration. Now, this operational strategy results in an inequitable distribution of funds between the defense and the non defense related accounts, particularly labor HHS. While our defense related programs are critical to the nation, our non-defense accounts are equally important in providing uh, for our people. If history proves correct, we are again in danger of entering the appropriations process that is likely to break down the committee and on the House floor due to uncertainties 
about the total 302B allocations for all of the appropriations subcommittee bills for FY18. I'd be remiss if I didn't say that it will be unconscionable for any of us to help pass spending bills that shift burdens onto working families and the most vulnerable people in our nation. Agreeing to subcommittee allocations um, bill by bill puts us at great danger of doing just that. In my subcommittee, agriculture, programs like Rural Housing's 502 Single Family Direct Loan Program, which serves families that cannot secure mortgages elsewhere, or the Rural Water and Waste Disposal Program. Those are in danger. Both are targeted for elimination by the Trump budget and will face an uphill battle without a good allocation for the bill that funds them. There are countless other examples that I'm sure my fellow members will discuss. While we're here in support of this Milcon VA bill that takes care of our service members and their families, it strengthens our military infrastructure, it ensures that veterans have access to quality health care, we still owe it to the American people to do the jobs we were elected to perform, and that's to serve all of our citizens. In closing, I truly believe that there's no greater service in protecting and providing for the American people, which we can and we should do by adequately and appropriately resourcing a federal government that works for everybody in this country. With that, I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Thank Bishop. You. Uh, Ms. Lee is recognized. I offer uh, my prayers and thoughts for uh, Steve and all of those injured in yesterday's um, horrific tragedy. And also, uh, just say thank you to the brave uh, Capitol Hill police and emergency responders for their courage and, and their bravery. And also, Mr. Chairman, I just want to take this moment to say this uh, committee really has been an, an example of working together in bipartisanship. And it's due to the leadership on both sides and the members uh, who have really uh, made this committee, I think, an example of what uh, this body should be. So thank you. This um, allocation, and I associate myself with all of the re uh, comments that have been made, uh, but and, and also the MILCON uh, allocation, it does reflect our unwavering commitment to uh, America's veterans and their families. But it's really a disgrace that we have yet to pass a budget. Uh, and of course, this type of piecemeal approach is really unacceptable, and quite frankly, it's irresponsible. We're really hurting the American people without a budget, without agreed upon spending levels. It's really a shame that we have once again kicked the can down the road, and that's what we're doing. And this pr approach, though, has become all too familiar uh, in recent years. Now, if we don't set uh, priorities in our own personal and household budgets, we all would probably go bankrupt. It's a terrible example that we're setting um, for the rest of the country, and we should know better. Let me be clear. If we don't address the top-line numbers immediately, our very other important bills, as we've heard earlier, including Labor H and SFOPs, which I sit on, will bear the brunt of these re reckless decisions. And I know, for example, the seniors have got to be very anxious uh, with regard to the proposed budget in terms of the cuts to Meals on Wheels. Not having a budget doesn't reassure them nor reduce their fear of losing uh, their meals. Not having a budget um, really does such a disservice, not only to our seniors, but to our young people, to our entire country. So it's my hope that we will address uh, the fiscal 18 budget actually before we see another bill in this committee. So thank you again, Mr. Chairman, and I yield back. Ms. Lee, Mr. Cartwright is recognized. Um, at the risk of beating a dead horse, um, uh, I, I want to add my voice to those uh, who have already beaten it dead. Um, uh, we're, uh, we're legislating uh, blind here. Uh, uh, I do want to commend uh, uh, my fellow members, uh, Chairman Dent and Ranking Member Wasserman Schultz, on a fine bill. Uh, and uh, uh, I, uh, I want to express my uh, abiding affection for my fellow Pennsylvanian 
Chairman Dent, uh, and my full-throated support for our American veterans and the VA administration. But um, when you when you add six billion to a program w without knowing where you're cutting that six billion from in other places, you don't know about Meals on Wheels. You don't know about whether LIHEAP is being cut. Uh, you don't know where the cuts are coming, and so we're kind of buying a pig in a poke here. Uh, and so uh, I, I wanted to say that, Mr. Chairman, and uh, I thank you for the time, and I yield back. Thank you. Any further uh, general discussion? Let me give a, what I think is a friendly response. We, we're all part of a same team here, and may I say we can wait and do nothing, or we can move forward to the best of our ability, and on other occasions we've done that. Uh, I, I'm in favor of moving forward. I think we've got some work to do, and I think we've done some important work today, and I know that as we move forward, we will work together through this situation. Uh, any further comments? If there are any amendments to this uh, allocation? Uh, hearing none, uh, let me see here. Uh, if there are no further amendments or comments, I recognize Mr. Rogers for a motion to approve the interim uh, 302B allocation. Mr. Chairman, I move that the committee approve the interim report on the 302B allocations for fiscal year 2018. The, the question, thank you, Mr. Rogers. The question is on the, uh, uh, on the motion. Uh, those in favor say aye. aye. Those opposed say nay. Uh, in my opinion, the ayes have it. The amendment is approved, and I thank you all. We want a voice vote. Okay, voice vote is uh, recorded vote, please. Uh, clerk will tally. Call the roll. Mr. Adderholt. Mr. Adderholt, aye. Mr. Aguilar. Mr. Aguilar, nay. Mr. Amade. Mr. Bishop. Mr. Bishop, nay. Mr. Calvert. Mr. Calvert, aye. Mr. Carter. Mr. Carter, aye. Mr. Cartwright. Mr. Cartwright, no. Ms. Clark, no. Ms. Clark, no. Mr. Cole, aye. Mr. Cole, aye. Mr. Cuellar, yes. Mr. Cuellar, no. Mr. Culberson, aye. Mr. Culberson, aye. Ms. Deloro, no. Ms. Deloro, no. Mr. Dent, aye. Mr. Dent, aye. Ms. diaz Ballard, Mr. diaz Ballard, aye. Mr. Fleischman, aye. Mr. Fleischman, aye. Mr. Fortenberry, Mr. Fortenberry, aye. Mr. Freelinghuisen, aye. Mr. Freelinghuisen, aye. Ms. Granger, Ms. Granger, aye. Mr. Graves, Mr. Graves, aye. Ms. Dr. Harris, Dr. Harris, aye. Ms. Herrera Butler, Ms. Herrera Butler, aye. Mr. Jenkins, Mr. Jenkins, aye. Mr. Joyce, Mr. Joyce, aye. Ms. Captor, Ms. Captor, nay. Ms. Mr. Kilmer. Mr. Kilmer, nay. Miss Lee. Miss Lee, nay. Mrs. Lowy. No. Mrs. Lowy, nay. Miss McCollum. Miss McCollum, nay. Miss Meng. Miss Meng, nay. Mr. Molinar. Mr. Molinar, aye. Mr. Newhouse. Mr. Newhouse, aye. Mr. Palazzo. Mr. Palazzo, aye. Miss Pingree. Ms. Pingree, nay. Mr. Pocan. Mr. Pocan. Mr. Pocan, nay. Mr. Price. No. Mr. Price, nay. Mr. Quigley. No. Mr. Quigley, nay. Mrs. Roby. Mrs. Roby, aye. Mr. Rogers. Aye. Mr. Rogers, aye. Mr. Rooney. Aye. Mr. Rooney, aye. Ms. Roybal Allard. Ms. Roybal Allard, nay. Mr. Rupesberger, Mr. Rupesberger, nay. Mr. Ryan, no. Mr. Ryan, nay. Mr. Serrano, Mr. Serrano, nay. Mr. Simpson, Mr. Simpson, aye. Mr. Stewart, Mr. Stewart, aye. Mr. Taylor, Mr. Taylor, aye. Mr. Valadeo, Mr. Valadeo, aye. Mr. Visklosky, Mr. Visklosky, nay. Ms. Wasserman Schultz. Ms. Wasserman Schultz, nay. Mr. Womack. Mr. Womack, aye. Mr. Yoder. Mr. Yoder, aye. Mr. Young. Mr. Young, aye.
us a card. Uh, uh, okay, y'all. Uh, are there any members who uh, wish to record uh, their vote or change their vote? Seeing none, the clerk will tally. I'm not sure they heard that, but... <laughs> 